sort of time travel Tuesday. <laughs> Probably more like time travel Thursday or even Friday, depending on when this video is coming out. Um, first of all, I want to say sorry and also thank you guys for um, bearing with me through this weird uh, schedule this week. Um, the holidays have descended and um, brought a little bit of mayhem in their wake, as they always do. So it's thrown my schedule a little out of whack this week. So thank you for being patient with the weirdness. But before I get to this week's Time Travel Tuesday, I want to share something with you guys that I'm really excited about. It's something that I'll be doing here in the next few weeks. So, beginning now, Time Travel Tuesday and Thrifty Thursday are going to be on hiatus for a few weeks. And the reason for that is that I'm going to be doing something really special that I like to call 12 Days of Role Plays. So even though Time Travel Tuesday and Thrifty Thursday won't be coming out for a few weeks, you guys are going to get plenty of videos from me, all in the form of role plays. So starting on December 14th all the way to December 25th, which for some is Christmas Day, and for others, it's just December 25th. But starting on the 14th and going all the way to the 25th, I'll be uploading one roleplay every single day. So that's 12 days. Hence, the 12 days of roleplays. And I'm really, really excited about it. Um, the way it's going to work is that each roleplay is going to... Um, they're all going to fit together. And you'll see what I mean, I won't tell you too much right now, but um, they're all going to be related to one another. So, between now and the 14th, I just need that time to get ready for that and, you know, of course, shoot and edit those videos so that I can get one out every single day. So, I'm really looking forward to that. Be sure to uh, check uh, your feed, I guess, uh, your sub subscription box on December 14th for the first of the 12 roleplays. Cool. So, moving on. Um, I want to share with you today's Time Travel Tuesday topic slash item. As you may remember, on last week's Time Travel Tuesday, was it last week? On the last Time Travel Tuesday, I told you guys that there would be no vote because it was going to be Allie's choice. And that's because I found something really wonderful for me that I want to share with you guys. Something that's very, very nostalgic in my life, particularly. And, as many of you know, one of my favorite movies on the whole world the Sound of Music. And I found this great book. It's the Sound of Music Family Scrapbook. Uh, just full of interviews and stories and pictures, all compiled by the actors who played the seven Von Trapp children in the film with Julie Andrews. And I'm gonna be sharing this book with you guys today and flipping through it. Hopefully, even if you're not a, as big a Sound of Music fan as I am, and I know many of you probably aren't, hopefully you'll still find this interesting and, of course, relaxing. So, that's what I'll be talking about today. Hope you enjoy the sound of music. Family scrapbook. Let's go check it out. So now we can take a closer look at my new book. I've 
flipped through it a couple of times and looked at some of the pictures and read little bits of it, but it's pretty big. And there's lots of really <laughs> great history and information in here. So, this is The Sound of Music. Family Scrapbook The Inside Story of the Beloved Movie Musical Revealed by the Actors Who Starred as the Von Trapp Children It says, contains never-before-seen personal photos and collectibles from Carmian Carr, Nicholas Hammond, Heather Menzies, Dwayne Chase, Angela Cartwright, Debbie Turner, and Kim Carruth. I think I said all those right. Carmine Carr played Liesel. Nicholas Hammond was um, Friedrich. Heather Menzies played Louisa. Dwayne Chase was Kurt. Angela Cartwright was Brigitte. Debbie Turner was Marta. And Kim Carruth was uh, Gretel. So there, the actors are listed here in order of their age. What I actually didn't realize when I got this was that it says it right here, but I didn't notice. It says, includes a DVD of exclusive onset behind-the-scenes home movie footage. And the DVD is right on the inside cover. Right here. It says, Our Home Movies 1964. And I can't wait to watch this. I haven't watched it yet. But there's a, a DVD right Sound of Music, Family Scrapbook. There's some cute little photos here. Uh, this is a photo, I'm not sure if you can tell, of uh, Nicholas Hammond, who played Friedrich. Daniel, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right. Maybe it's Truett, who played Rolf, and Kim Gareth, who was Gretel. And the caption says, Nicholas Hammond, Daniel Truett, uh, or however you say it, and Kim Gareth go sightseeing on a day off from filming. She looks really cute in her little traveling gear. read the contents. We won't go through everything because it's a big book, but maybe a couple highlights. So yeah, the introduction. The real Von Trapps. So it tells the story of uh, the real Von Trapp family. The auditions. Carmi and Car. My favorite things. Bon voyage. On location, Nicholas Hammond, Rock the Boat, Meet the Parents, 
Heather Menzies Singing and Dancing Duane Chase On Set Angela Cartwright Robert Wise The Escape Debbie Turner The Premiere Kim Karras Becoming a Family And then The Index This is a picture of uh, Kurt and Marta, or Dwayne Chase and Debbie Turner, with uh, Baroness Schrader, who was played by Eleanor Parker. She's kind of a semi villain in the story. She wasn't especially nice. I like this picture. This is a picture of Friedrich, Brigitte, and Griddle. Or, uh, what's his name? Nicholas Hammond, Angela Cartwright, and Kim Carruth. And the caption says, uh, Kim Carruth, Angela Cartwright, and Nicholas Hammond enjoy recess outside of the schoolhouse on the Fox lot. And I like that because the cast members who were still school-aged had to attend school while they were on set. Skip ahead a little bit. is Heather Menzies, who was uh, Louisa. Oh, and this is really cute. It's a, a letter from 20th Century Fox to the parents of Kim Carruth, who played Gretel. She was very, very young, uh, confirming her employment says, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Gareth, Enclosed herewith is an executed copy of the employment agreement dated February 21st, 1964, between this company and your daughter, Kim Gareth. This copy is for your records. Very truly yours, 20th Century Fox Film. in a few commercials. Uh, but this one was, I think, where he got noticed. It was for the International House of Pancakes. <laughs> uh, it's a pancake batter advertisement. There he is, about to enjoy a nice led director Robert Wise to be concerned about the color of her eyes. And actually, I think I read somewhere in here earlier that when she first auditioned, they weren't sure about her because her eyes were very blue. And they thought her eyes might have been too blue for the role, so they had to do a lot of screen testing before they decided that she was right for the role. 
based on the color of her eyes. <laughs> this is a picture of all of the kids at the marketplace during the Do-Re-Mi sequence. It says, In this scene, we were at the marketplace getting food for the picnic. Notice the orange crate that says Product of Israel right here. After the film was released, someone realized that Israel did not exist at the time the story took place. That's a funny little blue. This is interesting. Um, it's a picture of Carmi and Carr sort of taking guitar lessons because in the film she plays guitar a couple of times, but she did not originally know how to play. But she learned just for this. This caption says, uh, It was difficult to learn to play the guitar. I took lessons every minute I could to learn the title song that I played. Liesl, uh, with Michael Jackson, and um, let's see who else. There's some um, some of her family, and also uh, Heather Menzies and her family. And the reason she's hanging out with uh, Michael Jackson is that she became his. Um, I'll read you this little section. Um, so she gave up acting and uh, spent most of her adult life after that um, just raising her kids, but this says, Eventually, I did start working again, but in an entirely different field. For many years, I had a love of interior design, and in the late 1970s, I finally started my own company, Carmi and Car Designs. My clients have included Angela Cartwright and Heather Menzies, who were both in The Sound of Music, and a recording artist who once lived in Beverly Hills, but read in the newspaper that Liesl from The Sound of Music had moved to Encino after she got married. He said to his mother, Liesl lives in Encino, why don't we move there? And that's how Michael Jackson and his family ended up living down the street from me. He had an interior designer working on his house, but was unhappy with him, and their builder suggested he meet me. Michael was a huge fan of The Sound of Music, and he used to always ask me questions about making the film. He wanted his home to have the same feel as Disneyland. He even wanted one room to resemble the Pirates of, their, of the Caribbean ride. So he asked me to go to the theme park with him many times. He would dress up in disguise, so no one would know it was him though people always did. It was easier to walk through the park undisturbed before he released the Thriller album. Not so easy once it became one of the best-selling albums of all time. <laughs> That's funny. Liesl, uh, the character, was meant to be 16, but Carmi and Carr was actually 21 when uh, the movie was filmed. This is interesting. I didn't know this. The scene uh, for my favorite things, the scene during the thunderstorm when all the kids come into Maria's bedroom because they're afraid, was the first scene that they filmed in the whole movie. That's interesting. says <laughs> uh, what does it say? 
Francis, and so on the second day of production, Julie Andrews filmed her first scene with Kim Carruth, Debbie Turner, Angela Cartwright, Dwayne Chase, Heather Menzies, Nicholas Hammond, and Carmian Carr. After rehearsing for weeks, cameras were now rolling for the scene in Maria's bedroom, where the children rush in, frightened by the bright lightning and crashing thunder. This was the first time we had walked onto a set in our costumes, had met the entire crew, and had to do it, not for practice, but to be recorded on film for all time, says Nicholas. There was no room for mistakes, and we had to blend in with all the technical work going on around us. The rain machines pouring water down the windows, the machine with its preordained cues for thunder, the camera angles, the lights, the marks to hit around the room and on the bed itself. It was also significant, as this was the first time on screen we worked together as a group, as actors and as characters, seven siblings with their governess, not just for a quick exchange, but for a full sequence. Often, directors like to start with a short, easy moment on film, just to break the ice, especially with a fledgling cast. But our very first time in front of the cameras, we had to appear as if we were already a tight group, brothers and sisters who knew each other's personalities, and a governess with whom we had a complex relationship some of us still uncertain whether we wanted to invite her into our lives. This number was to be the turning point, the moment in the story where we all, consciously or subconsciously, emotionally accepted her. Added to that was the fact that the song itself was already famous from the stage play and various artists who had performed it on radio radio and television. wore hats between takes to avoid the risk of getting a tan or a burn during production, something that would be a nightmare for the makeup department. That's good thinking, because they did have to do a lot of scenes outside, so it would have been bad if they all started getting really tan. It's a poem written by Angela Cartwright about Salzburg, which is where uh, Sound of Music was filmed. Let me see if I can read it. It says, When we heard Salzburg was a lovely place, my family and I, we packed up our case and set off across the United States across its mountains, rivers, and lakes. New York was our very first stop. I liked Rhode Island a real lot. We landed in London on a Monday. After leaving U.S. on a Sunday, we landed in Salzburg in the afternoon and arrived at the hotel very soon. Uh, We've gone to the fortress and saw many a thing and went to Glockenspiel to hear the bells ring. And when I look at this, what does that say? Salzek's foam, I often think of Home Sweet Home. I'm not sure what that last one is. That's cute though. I like this picture right here. I didn't know that. Emma. It says, 
Julie Andrews' baby Emma was often on the set with the Von Trapp kids while the company was in Austria. This is a list of hotels. It says, everyone received a list of who was staying at which hotel because the cast and crew were spread all over Salzburg and it was long before cell phones. <laughs> so it tells uh, the names of people and where they were staying and who they were cast as or what their uh, role was. says, when the cast and crew, the Sound of Music, arrived in Salzburg, they were divided up into different hotels. The seven actors portraying the Von Trapp children checked into the Hotel Mirabel with their parents. Director Robert Wise and star Julie Andrews and her 18-month-old daughter moved into the... Oh, I don't know how to say that. Osterkaiser? <laughs> Never mind. I don't know how to say that. And Christopher Plummer and other adult members of the cast were giving lodging the Hotel Bristol. Wow, so her baby was only 18 months old at the time. Not even two. That's interesting. So in here, this little fold out. It's kind of like the Nirvana book. items in it. There are a few things inside of here. It tells you what each of them are. I'll do them in order. So this is item one. It says Dwayne Chase holiday card. Dwayne Chase is the actor. It says, My wife Petra and I developed a warm friendship with the real Captain Von Trapp's daughter, Maria, says Duane Chase. She would occasionally call us at home, and we would phone her. Petra and Maria often spoke in German, which is why the holiday cards we received every year from Maria contained some German words, too. So this is a nice little holiday card. I won't read all of this, because I've tried to, actually, and I can't make out all handwriting, but the card itself says, May the joyous spirit of Christmas remain with you throughout the coming year of 2004. And then this is a little segment in German that um, I, I don't speak German, so I couldn't read it to you. Um, and these are just some uh, nice little holiday sentiments. Unfortunately, I can't read this handwriting very clearly, but it still looks nice. Okay, next. This is a telegram. It says, uh, it's a telegram for Nicholas Hammond. It says, this is the telegram that would change my life, says Nicholas Hammond. It was sent by my agent on New Year's Eve asking me to audition for The Sound of Music three days later in New York. This says, Can Nicholas be New York Friday, January 3rd for meeting with casting director for Sound of Music film? Call me. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what this says. Regards, Ed Robbins. It's a Western It's neat. And Nicholas Hammond was uh, the actor who played Friedrich. This is a thank you note oh. from Robert Wise, uh, the director, the producer and director, to Carmine Carr, who played Liesel. It says, Dear Carmine, many thanks for all the lovely qualities you brought to Liesel. 
and for being so convincingly 16. Best wishes, Bob Wise. Because she was, of course, not 16, she was 21. And this is Heather Menzies' autograph book. This says, after production on the film uh, was complete, we had a wrap party for the cast and crew, says Heather Menzies. We had returned to our normal lives, and it was so good to see everyone again. I tried to get as many autographs as I could at the party, and to this day, I treasure the messages people wrote in my autograph book. So, let's see. It says, The Sound of Music, Heather Menzies, 1964, 20th Century Fox. Dear Heather, Thanks again for your wonderful job on Sound of Music, and for starting my day right. Best wishes for the future, Bob Wise. This is really cute. This was Kim Gareth, who was Gretel. She's a very little girl, so you can kind of tell that a little kid wrote this. It says, Kim Gareth, to the sweetest girl and prettiest girl. Love, Kim Carruth. Gretel Von Trapp. This says, Heather, with much love to you always, and thanks for being so wonderful in the picture. Love, Christopher Plummer. That was uh, the actor who played Captain Georg Van... I mean, Georg Von Trapp. This is from... Me and Carr, who played Liesel, it says to Heather, I want to wish you all the happiness in the world. Please stay as nice and happy as you are now. Thank you for being such a wonderful sister. Love, Carmian. Oh, um, Heather Menzies, if I didn't mention it, was the actress who played Louisa. I think she was. Oh no, not quite. She wasn't the only sister who was blonde. Gretel. Louisa was the older sister who was blonde. This says, To Louisa, Heather, My thirteen-year-old sister, I hope we can work together again sometime, because we make wonderful sisters. If ever you're let down, just think of the Beatles. <laughs> okay, love, Brigida, Angela Carter. I think that this might be this little symbol. Might be a, a little symbol they had. They had a little secret club together because they were very good friends. Uh, Angela Cartwright and Heather Menzies. And they had all these secret little symbols and codes that they wrote to each other, and I think that might have. This might have been one of them. says, to Heather M, to a lovely girl, and to a pretty girl. Uh, and I can't read what this says, this bit. Your sister. But it looks like it was written by another sort of young child, so I'm guessing it was Debbie Turner. But I can't read it. And this one says, to Heather, thank you very much for all the laughs. And for being a wonderful person to work with. Good luck, Nicholas Hammond. Nikki, of course. And Nicholas Hammond was Friedrich. These are nice.
Texas, visiting the salt mines with their families was one of the kids' favorite field trips. Interesting. I guess the kids on set got to take sort of school field trips or something. Oh, here we go, yeah, this is about their school. This says a small meeting room in the hotel lobby served as the schoolroom when the younger cast member weren't filming. The teacher in Salzburg was Jean uh, Seaman. <laughs> this says, even while attending school at the studio, the children received report cards, like any student in the Los Angeles City school system. Debbie received an A in every graded subject. were part of their schoolwork. The kids had to write reports about them. Angela and Duane turned in these papers. They had really lovely handwriting for little kids. That's interesting. is the scene uh, where the kids all fall out of the boat. I want to read this little, this couple pages to you because <laughs> it's crazy. Um, the little one, Kim, who played Gretel, apparently nearly drowned or something during this scene. I'll read it to you. The boat scene in The Sound of Music has become legendary. Seven Von Trapp children and their governess are in a rowboat, returning home, where Captain Von Trapp and the Baroness await. As the boat comes into view, it capsizes, sending all of the passengers into the water. According to Kim, the original plan was to use my double, since I couldn't swim. Apparently, Robert didn't like the way the scene looked with her in place. He came to my mother and me and said, We really want Kimmy to do the scene. We'll have someone jump in and save her, but we really won't need to do that, because Julie's going to catch her. My mother said something like, Ah, uh, because she didn't want to say yes. So Robert talked about teamwork, and that was the magic word to me, so I said I would do it. If I had been Kim's mother, says Heather Menzies, I would have said, Have a nice time. I hope your movie is a great success, but I'm leaving. Three minutes before the scene was to be filmed, Julie Andrews was told, By the way, you need to catch the baby because she can't swim. So she was terrified too, says Kim. Robert Wise called, Action! And the cameras rolled. It all went exactly as planned, Kim explains. I fell overboard. Julie fell in the same direction and caught me right away without any problems. That might have been the end of the story, but Wise didn't like the first take and wanted to shoot it again. As Kim explains, we had to dry off and change into an identical set of our horribly ugly curtain costumes and do it again. If you watch very carefully, you will see a look of abject terror on my face because I was scared to death. Heather remembers what happened as Wise continued to film. The water was murky and it was difficult to find Kim, who sank to the bottom of the lake like a boulder. There were guys standing by on the shore in bathing suits ready to jump in the minute Robert said cut. It was really horrifying. What Robert wanted was to have one long shot of us falling out of the boat and coming ashore out of the water, but he couldn't get it because
course they had to save Kim. <laughs> in the tank used in the movie, I fell forward as I was supposed to, Kim recounts. I sank underwater, and Julie fell in the opposite direction, in back of the boat. I swallowed a lot of lake water, until Alan Callow, the son of assistant director Reggie Callow, jumped in and saved me. When you watch the movie, there is a jump cut to Heather. That's because they had to edit out the footage where they're saving me and everything is so chaotic. You can imagine my mother's reaction. They had to restrain her to prevent her from jumping in the water to rescue me. She couldn't swim either, so that would have been a real disaster. Some crew members were holding her back while she was screaming, My baby, my baby. <laughs> That's insane. This says, During this take, Julie Andrews fell off the back side of the boat. This is why, oh no, sorry, this is the take that was eventually used in the film. The boat was rigged to rock back and forth a few times before it completely tipped over. Everyone had to pull together and do their part for this complex scene. Oh, this is terrible. This says, there were leeches on the bottom of the lake, so the cast got out of the water as quickly as they could. This is Debbie Turner's stand-in. Interesting. She's a lot taller. Well, a little bit taller. <laughs> this is great. This says, So they would look wet. The kids were drenched with water before each day with the dreaded freezing lake water in the can. I guess it was really cold water. And you can see someone pouring water onto a um, Carmian car. That's funny. And this is a swatch of fabric from the plate clothes made from curtains. when the sun came out. They sipped hot chocolate, but Angela says she remembers being given a few sips of brandy to warm up. Or was that a rumor we kids started? She laughs. <laughs> this is great. This is a picture of Julie Andrews um, getting the news that she was nominated for an Oscar for Mary Poppins, which is another one of my favorite films. I love Julie Andrews. This says, thanks to the latest issue of Variety, Julie Andrews had just received the news of her Oscar nomination for Mary Poppins. Accent coach Pamela Danova looks over Julie's shoulder. another fold out with uh, some little treasures inside. I'm interested in this one in particular. This is uh, Heather Menzies' Club Notebook. Uh, Heather and Angela's Club Notebook is filled with secret symbols, codes, and messages which are still a mystery to this day. was called He Paul Ang, which is a combination of, I guess, Heather and Angela and Paul in the middle. I don't know what that's about. Maybe Paul McCartney, since they like seem to like the Beatles.
here's the, the rules of the club. Rule number one, no boys or girls allowed, but members, uh, Paul and Dawn. <laughs> number two, bring something every day. Uh, looks like a little secret symbol. It says, uh, number three says, write in diary every day. Number four, we have our magazine ready every Wednesday. Number five, always be faithful to the whatever that symbol is. Number six, don't show anyone our he pulling rules, motto, or slogan. Number seven, sing our songs in public, but only to people who can be trusted. And number eight, never let anyone in on our secrets. This is cute. Important dates. <laughs> and there's one here. March 18th, 1964. Club started. That's the only important date listed. Looks like they had a little uh, tapping system of communicating with one another. One tap means pass notes. Two taps means talk. Three taps means look. Four taps means stop notes. And five taps means hurry. Interesting. In club names, they had special names for their club. Christy was Angela, and Cindy was Heather. This is cute. I used to start little secret clubs with my friends when I was a kid, too. Okay, looks like the club motto is Mum. The club slogan is... Ricky Licky Lack and a Buddy Up a Whack. <laughs> Whatever that means. And this is a code that they have. That I don't know. I don't understand. And it says language, gibberish, or sign language. The club pledge is I pledge I will be loyal to the club, faithful to the Beatles, and obey all rules at all times. There's a song that goes hep hepa hepala hepaling woo hepaling yeah 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 <laughs> that's so cute this is a really great photograph of the do re mi number where they're doing uh, the uh, tea a drink with jam and bread about Heather Menzies, who was uh, Louisa. And some pictures of her and her family. And 
TV show she did. She did Logan's Run. This is cute. This says, The seven young actors never got tired of hearing Julie Andrews hit that incredible note at the end of Do Re Me. I love that part. Julie Andrews is really, really cute in this movie. This is tricky, it says, At the Pegasus Fountain, the kids had to swing their arms and keep their balance on the fountain ledge while singing. That sounds really difficult. to her father during shooting. She missed him and drew him pictures. And this says, Dear Father, this is the Mirabelle Gardens that we did. Uh, do, re, mi. <laughs> she drew a picture of the gardens. says, this touching moment in the Von Trapp home is a turning point in the film. We were in awe of the stunning Eleanor Parker, who portrayed the Baroness Elsa Schrader, says Angela Cartwright, and we loved our quirky uncle Max Detweiler, played by Richard Hayden. Both of their performances enriched the film tremendously. This says, Duane tries to dance the Lendler with Julie Andrews. I really could dance it, but had to act as if I couldn't, he explains. But Robert Wise did let me really dance it correctly once. This scene's really cute, it's where Fraulein Maria is trying to teach Kurt how to dance. Uh, a traditional Austrian dance. It's very awkward. This is a page on Dwayne Chase. Well, interesting. Kurt Russell also tried out for uh, The Sound of Music. Uh, 
that this is a letter from Robert Wise and then this is a piece of artwork done by In the movie, the Von Trapps pushed the car through these gates when they attempted to escape. That's the entrance of the house. What I really want to see is this, though. It says, Angela Cartwright Beatles Diary, Once in a Lifetime. When she was 11, Beatles fan Angela Cartwright had enough imagination to write Once in a Lifetime, a fictional account of the Beatles visiting the set of The Sound of Music to meet the cast. dedicated to our good friend, Mr. Shaplin, who made it happen once in my lifetime. Chapter 1, A Hopeful Day It was one more day till the Beatles would arrive, and I went to bed with high hopes, for I knew it would not be tomorrow I would meet them, it would be the next day, if any at all. For the Beatles would be playing at the Hollywood Bowl the first day that they were here. They were having a few days of rest then. The reason that my hopes were so high was that Mr. Chaplin, the music director of The Sound of Music, knew Mr. Walter Shannon, the producer of the new Beatle picture. My girlfriend that was working on the picture with me, Heather Menzies, wanted to meet them too. So Mr. Chaplin said he would do what he could. You can always rely on Mr. Chaplin. One day, we were talking to Mr. Wise's secretary, of course, we were talking about the Beatles. And she said, What if one kissed you? Heather and I looked at each other. The same, the same thing ran through both of our minds. What if one did? What would we do? I screamed and clung to Heather while she staggered away, ready to faint. <laughs> when I woke up the next morning over the radio, I heard all Beatles songs, for they would arrive today. We told everyone on the set, they didn't seem as happy as, as we were. I didn't get to sleep that night, but that day Mr. Chaplin had said, I think it's possible. When I arrived the next day, Heather was outside the stage door with a twinkle in her eye. Ooh, could this be it? I walked in the stage and saw Mr. Chaplin. He said, hi, I want you to meet somebody. Heather threw me a smile and I stared back at her. Soon he came to a stop. This is Mr. Shannon. Tall, thin man in front of us shook our hands. I whispered to Heather. He shook Paul's hand. Heather stared at me and then at her hands. Oh, I think it says Mr. Shanson. <laughs> Mr. Shanson said, I'm afraid that the Beatles have been very busy with their trip and all. Heather and I looked at each other with no change of expression. But our faces changed from gr grim ones to grinning ones. He said, I want to talk to you in private. That's it. That's the whole story. That's really cute. They really love the Beatles. Well, guys. much as I'm going to read for now. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed flipping through this great book with me. I'm going to keep reading this because it's really <laughs> warming my heart. I, uh, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this week's Time Travel Tuesday, or Thursday, or possibly Friday. And I will be seeing you guys again very soon. But 
until then. Sweet dreams. used to read it to me before bed. And now when I read it to my son, I always <laughs> feel a little bit kind of sleepy and more relaxed. Just because of the association I have. 